Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for the joy of being together, the joy of fellowship, and the joy of learning at the feet of the Lord Jesus together. We're asking, Lord, tonight, you reveal your mind to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Grant us your grace Amen. to be doers of the word. And so bless us here, bless all our leaders, everywhere we are sharing this word of God together, in Jesus' name. Amen. Establish your people in the truth. Amen. Strengthen us in the word. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, you can sit down. We're coming to Second Samuel chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Samuel chapter 13, we're looking at verse 3. But Amnon had a friend. Stop there for a moment. A friend. Amnon had a friend. When well, you write the biographies of people you appreciate and people you love, and you are projecting that this is number one family in that nation and it's a great family it's a favored family they craft the biography in such a way that negative things like this will not come out they'll cover it up that's the difference in the word of god that the word of god makes everything plain makes everything clear nothing is covered up Beyond that, the word of God says, all scripture is given by inspiration. And it's the inspiration of God that has given us the whole scripture. And it says, it is profitable for doctrine, for learning, for instruction, in righteousness. So that the man of God will be, tell me, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Many people, when they look at a chapter, and they say, oh, that doesn't concern me. And so if it doesn't concern me, why should I study it? Look at this chapter from the perspective of a father. That a father has children, and these children are growing up. One name is Jonadab. The other name is Amnon. The other name is Tamar. How do you resolve these children? Sometimes you find a mother and a father, and these are growing children, and they're using the same room. They don't think that, hey, wait a minute, Tamar is growing up, and Amnon is growing up. The parents normally think nothing terrible will happen. Because after all, they're children of the same parents. That's why this chapter is preserved for us. There are times too that you are a pastor. And then you have different kinds of people in the congregation. And once we teach doctrine, we teach the word of God, and we tell them this is this and this is that, that is all. We do not look at all these details. How do they live? Where do they live? And what happens to them? Our own children are growing up. And as our children are growing up, we don't understand how to tell them to differentiate between this and that, and also the importance of friends or the influence of friends among them and then we ourselves as members of the church something has happened we overlook that another thing happens we overlook that and they are piling up you look at david david was a militant man you wouldn't say that david did not know the word of god look at the psalms and you will see that he knew the mind of god he knew the revelation of god he knew the doctrines of the bible and he knew righteousness and holiness and yet even though as a leader he was militant he was courageous you meet him on the field on the battlefield as he confronted goliath that man was courageous when he came back home, Adonijah was there 
he never corrected Adonijah about anything. And here is Amnon, and Amnon did whatever he wanted to do. He was sorrowful. He was uh, unhappy. How could this happen? He didn't do anything. And here is Absalom too. Absalom even, you know, made a feast and said, Daddy, you must come, you must come. He tried to put pressure on David. And David just felt, no, I wouldn't uh, come. And he said, okay, if you are not going to come, let all my brothers and sisters, let them be there. And David said, all right, let them go. And then all these things happen. So we have a reason for learning from all these chapters. And there is a lot in these two chapters. But I'm going to concentrate tonight on a friend's influence on man's destiny. A friend's influence on man's destiny. As we come to the chapter, we meet Amnon, we meet Jonadab, we meet Tamar, we meet Absalom. And then you see the string of things that happened. You see the chain of events that happened. First of all, Amnon desired Tamar. That's why it starts. A thought in the heart, a desire in the mind. And then he couldn't do anything about that. He was getting lean, which means the thoughts of our hearts can affect our health. The desires we have, unfulfilled, can affect our health. You know, sometimes you find uh, some of our not too young brothers and sisters getting to their late 20s and late 30s, and you just observe. They're getting lean, and they're getting lean, leaner and leaner every time. And they're almost anemic, and they don't have any strength. And you see their physique, and you say, well, I'm a pastor, I'm not going to bother about that. Why don't you ask her? Why don't you ask him? My brother, you're getting lean and leaner and leaner every day. It's, are you thinking about something? He's making himself sick. She's making herself sick. And if she continues like that, eventually a kind of sickness comes in. His immune system is disturbed. And he is decreased. And the things that will normally come, that your immune system will just ward off because you are strong, he cannot do that. And that's what was happening to Amnon. But as it happened to Amnon, David the father never noticed that. David the father never said that my son was submit to you. You're thinking about something. Come on here. Let's talk about this together and solve the problem. But it was his friend that said, as I watch you, as I look at you, looks like you are you're sick, aren't you? Because uh, of your physique and everything. And he opened up to him and said, you know what? I'm thinking about something. And I really passionately desire it and hope deferred and the desire I have, I cannot fulfill. That's what is making me sick. And then instead of that friend helping him, that friend counseled him, advised him. And then you will see that the advice of his friend led to the sin. The sin led to hatred and the crime of Absalom. And that led to the death of this man and his destruction and damnation in hell. It's a chain. And then that led to Absalom being driven away to exile. And that led to David's family being devastated. A series of calamities and eternal suffering caused by just a single piece of advice because if we don't give them the right advice if we're not at hand if we're not available to say hey this is the way why don't you go this way a lot of things will happen that's why i want to look at this tonight how does the influence of a friend affect your life my life our lives how does the impact and the influence of a friend affect Somebody's time of death. This man died prematurely. He shouldn't have died at this time. But because of the advice and the sin and the hatred and the anger and the thing that went on in the family, that's why all these things happened. And as you think about Jonadab 
I'll say Jonadab, what a fool. What a fool. He was really an enemy. Because eventually, he caused the death of this man. And Amnon, what a fool. What a fool. Because he shouldn't have died that way. Thinking about something he shouldn't be thinking about. Injuring himself. Destroying himself. And eventually, what a fool Amnon was. He knew. They were in the same family. As you were in the same family, you know the temperaments of people. He, he knew the temperament of, of uh, Absalom. He was older than Absalom. And he knew that this man, he might be quiet, but... He has something planted in that already, and already he should have known that this is what Absalom might plan. The man was a fool, and eventually they said, come and have a feast. And he went there sheepishly, foolishly, and he saw wine, he saw alcohol, and he just let go and drank and drank, and Absalom said, that man... Look at him when he becomes merry and he forgets and he drinks and he forgets his past. He drinks and he forgets his future. He drinks and he forgets himself in my house. Try that man. Have I not commanded you? Go and do it. And the man died. I say, Jonadab, what a fool. Amnon, what a fool. Absalom, what a feast. You know, the feast he had, that's the feast that drove him out of town. That's the feast that led him into exile eventually. There's no friend like Jesus. Give me a good amen. amen. I say, Jesus, what a friend. Jonadab, what a fool. Amnon, tell me, what a fool. Absalom, what a feast, Jesus. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials? Yes, sometimes we have. Have we temptations? Sometimes we do. Is there trouble anywhere? Sometimes there is. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord, tell me, in prayer. A friend's influence on man's destiny. We're looking at this under three perspectives. Number one, the corrupting advice of trifling friends trifling friends there are friends that's what they call themselves that's what you think about them that's what you call them they gamble with your life they gamble with your future they gamble with what is essentially important to you they gamble with your destiny but you call them friends they're trifling friends they trifle they minimize they make cheap. They look at your life and the advice they give you shows that they're not thinking of your destiny. They're not thinking of your future. The corrupting advice of trifling friends. Point number two. The corrective admonition of true friends. A true friend looks at you. You're thinking of what you shouldn't be thinking about. He gives you an admonition, a corrective admonition. A friend looks at you. You're not feeding well. You're not eating well. You're losing strength. You're losing stamina. You're losing focus. He'll not just look at you and turn the other way. My friend, something is wrong. And he gives you an admonition, a corrective admonition. A friend looks at you, it's like you're looking at the wrong direction, at the wrong thing. And because you put your mind on something that is hurting you. And are you not the son of a king? Are you not a king's kid? Don't you know your position? I'm not. 
Don't you know what lies ahead of you? And don't you know the privilege you have as a son to David? Don't you know you are a number one person in the number one family? Or are you like this? Let me give you an advice, an admonition that will correct your thinking. That's what a true, a true French will do. And you begin to look at the friends you have. When you have sorrow, when you have problem, when you have body, when you have pressure, do they give you admonition, corrective admonition, the corrective admonition of true friends? Point number three. The corresponding acknowledgement of the truest friend. The corresponding acknowledgement of the truest friend. Before we go on, I'll still come to that point three, of course, but think about this. You think, uh, do I have any friend? Let's think about this way. Let's say you have a friend, and it's a true friend, it's a faithful friend. It's a wonderful friend. It's an intelligent friend. It's a wise friend. But your friend traveled from your city and he traveled to the next city. Is he still your friend? I said, is he still your friend? Just because he traveled to the next city does not mean that he's no more your friend. I know he's still alive. In that, we're in the same nation. And it's in that other place. It's just a matter of picking up the phone. My friend, I want to count on your wisdom. I want to tap your brain. And I want to pick your brain. Can you give me some understanding here? You can call them. Not only that, your friend now has traveled to not another city. He has traveled to another country. As he has traveled to another country, you are friends, very close and very intimate. And you know the country he has traveled to. In that other country, here you are, and he is over there. Is he still your friend? Yes, of course. And now he's traveled to another continent. He's left Nigeria. He's left Africa. He's gone to Britain. He's gone to France. So he's gone to America. And uh, he's over there. You're over here. Are you still friends? Of course, of course. Now, Jesus is our friend. And even though he traveled to a far country, he left his wisdom behind. And he gave us his wisdom. And like Abraham told uh, that man in hell, he said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You see, have Moses there. All the wisdom, he deposited them here. All the prophets deposited them here. They can be your friends. When you have any challenge, you have temptation, you have trial, you have oppression, you have whatever it is, you can turn to these friends that they have gone to a far country. Doesn't mean that they are no friends anymore. We have the apostles. Look at Paul the apostle. And look at all the wisdom he left behind. Do I have any challenge, any problem? Here is my friend, and he has left the wisdom behind. And and here is Jesus. Look at the words of Jesus. There is no problem that comes in my life or your life that the promise of Christ won't promise somewhere will solve. We don't have any problem. I said we don't have any problem. We have promises we are not looking at. We have the friend that we are not looking at. And then we have the whole book, the whole Bible. And as you look at the whole book, you see, these are the words of my, number one, of my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, of all my friends, look at what they left behind. And every day, if I have any channel, I just go to my friend. And then I'm going to get something out of this. My life is going to be successful. I'm, I'm talking about myself. You will be happy. You will be righteous. You see, there is nothing that comes. We have the solution right here. And that's why we're studying this every time. And what you study, what we study, will be of benefit to you, to your family, to your children, and to the members of the church who are leading in Jesus' name. Point number one, give me number one there. The corrupting advice of trifling friends. We're coming to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 3. Look at verse 3. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. 
the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. Look at verse 4. And he said unto him, Why art thou being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And I'm not said unto him, I love Tamar. My brother Absalom's sister and Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. What a friend. Already the man was sick. Already the man was getting leaner every day. And even Jonadab mentioned that. He said, Why? Won't you tell me, as the king's son, that you are getting leaner? day by day and now he said this is the cause of my sickness he said all right make yourself sick more sick that you're so sick that the only thing that can satisfy you is food from Tamar. and when thy father cometh to thee say unto him i pray thee let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that i may see it and Eat it. What's the name of uh, Amnon's uh, friend? Jonadab. We're coming to verse 32. Verse 32. The deed has not been done. Absalom had planned, orchestrated his death. Amnon is gone. Amnon is dead. Everybody in the family, all the people that went for that feast, they became unhappy, they became sorrowful. And David heard about it, and David became so sorrowful. Look at verse 32. And Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, uh, David's uh, brother, answered and said, Let not my Lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. He said, no big deal. David, don't put your heart on this. I'm only Amnon is dead. I thought you were friends. What is the feeling of the friend? You know, some people, they cannot recognize who friends are. They cannot tell this is a friend or this is not a friend. Because look at the way the man is talking. Only Amnon is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this has been determined, tell me, from the day he forced his sister, Tamar. Ah, so you knew that Absalom had a determination. That this man, I'll get rid of him. You knew that, Jonadab. You knew that from that very day. And this young man, Amnon, did this on the strength of your counsel and your advice. And you know that uh, Absalom had this in mind. And you never told um, Amnon to watch and to be careful that that thing you did, this is the result. Because I know Absalom, I'm telling you for a fact that Absalom wants to get rid of you. And when they called them for the feast, Jonadab, where were you? You knew that they were going to the feast. And the way the story looks, uh, you know, it's written, it's written, it's like Jonadab found a way to excuse himself. He was watching from a distance. He would not be there. And you say, Amnon is your friend. And you did not warn him, you know what? I'm not going there. You know what? I don't think you should go there. Because you have something you've done. And that man, Absalom, is after your life. He knew it. So, when we talk about friends, we need to understand who friends really are. And uh, we we'll talk about this, the advice they gave. You know, advice comes from here, advice comes from there. There are people, the value of an advice, of the advice, is not much more than the strength of the man that gives the advice, or the knowledge of the man that gives the advice, or the, well, the promise or the prospect of the man that gives the advice. The advice anybody gives you is not of more value than the love and the value they put on your soul and they put on your life and let's look at you know advice 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 i pray god will help us 
the Lord will watch over you. All these prayers, I throw in advice and out. When it comes to you, let it stop there and examine this advice. This one is plastic. This one is wooden advice. This one is uh, light advice. This one does not carry weight. This one is not going to help. This one is not thinking about my future. This one is not thinking about my destiny. Advice. Because the advice may lead to another thing. Let's look at the book of Esther. The book of Esther. I'm reading from chapter 5 and verse 14. Advice. It says in chapter 5, verse 14, Then says Sherish, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon, then go thou in merrily with the king uh, unto the banquet, and the thing pleased him, and, and he caused the gallows to be made. You see, whenever we have problems, people know we have problems. And then we consult them, we tell them, I'm thinking of something, I'm sorrowful about something, I'm unhappy about something, I'm concerned about something, and I, I'm thinking of the things that surround me. And the advice people give us may compound the problem, may increase the problem. And because we are hungry for advice, we're thirsty for advice. We're passionate for advice. We're pursuing advice. It's like, I want advice, I want advice. Whether it's hygienic or not, I want to eat it up. Whether it is uh, going to be a good a nutrient or not, nourishing or not, I want to swallow it up. Be, hold on, hold on. When you're, so, when you're so eager for advice, it's very dangerous. And you don't know the minds of the people that are giving you the advice. And so he said, and this Haman came back home and he said, you know, the problem I have is any time I see that uh, Mordecai, he doesn't bow, he doesn't bend to me, I'm not happy. And he said, and you don't know what to do? All you need to do is set gallows there. And then you tell the king, uh, and when you tell the king uh, uh, that you, this man is doing something you don't appreciate, get rid of him. And be very careful. That man is a Jew. And already he said, he told the people, when they said, why are you not bound? Everybody is bound. He said, I'm different. I'm distinct. I'm distinguished. Because I am a Jew. Be very careful what you do to that man. And thank God, I'm not just a Jew. I'm a justified man of God. Talk about yourself. Who are you? Justified man, justified woman of God. I hope the people over the outside, I hope they are careful what they do to you because if they are not careful and they want to spill your blood, you'll still be alive. They will not be here to tell us the story of what has happened. We're precious, we're peculiar. I'm looking at peculiar people. Precious people. The Lord will take care of you in Jesus' name. Look at this now. We're looking at chapter 6, verse 13. Chapter 6, verse 13. And he, a man, to share his wife and all his friends. Everything that had befallen him, they will fall. Amen. Then said his wise men and Sirish, his wife, Unto him, ah, if Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him. Tell me, for thou shalt surely fall before him. Friends, friends. They told him just in chapter 5, there were the people that advised him. These were friends, friends, traveling friends. They gambled with his life. They gambled with his destiny. And the man could have repented. But he didn't have any friend to tell him to turn around. He could have gone to uh, the king himself. And he said, king, I have uh, an apology to make. Because, uh, you know, I was deceived. 
and you think of what I try to do, this is bad, and condemn himself before the king, and said, uh, king, please forgive me, and Esther, please forgive me, look at what I've done, and his life would have been spared, but no, his friends didn't tell him uh, there's anything you call repentance, his friends did not tell him uh, there's anything you call restitution, chapter 7, in chapter 7, verse 10, uh, chapter 7, verse 10, uh, so, they hanged who? Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was well, the king's wrath pacified. You see, there are people that, you know, have all these friends, and these friends, they're deceptive. They're deceptive. I pray you'll not fall into their hands in Jesus' name. And we're coming to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 10. Second Chronicles chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 10 verse 9. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people? Advice, advice. I have a challenge here. I have a problem here. I'm leading the people. And if the people have come to me and they have said, make the load lighter and make our body lighter. And I'm thinking of what I'm going to tell them, young man, you've inherited the throne and then you don't know what to tell them already. The scriptures are there. Already, this is not even begin of the Old Testament. Already we have all of Genesis to Deuteronomy. Already we have Joshua. Already we have the judges. Already we have the books of 1 uh, Samuel and 2 Samuel. We have the writings of David. Already we have the Psalms at that time because David is come and gone. And young man, you've been hated the throne. Go back to those uh, books and read. And this man we're talking about is the son of Solomon. That is, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived until that time. The books of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, all those books were there already. Ecclesiastes, everything there already. And the young man closed all those books. He didn't think of them. And he called his companions and friends and these young people, give me advice, give me advice. And these people that are going to give him advice, they're not reading the Bible. These people are not spiritual, and these people don't, they have never reigned, they have never ruled, they have never been kings, and you are a king, and the people that have never done what you are doing, you are asking them to come and give you advice. Advice. Like, a, you know, somebody is a married man, and he's having some, you know, some little, little issues with uh, the wife, and then goes to his friend who is not married, the friend who does not know how to even pray to have a wife. And you know, everybody is praying for him. He's trying to catch, he's missing, trying to catch and missing. And this one has got a wife already. And then he's going to somebody who is not married. Uh, give me advice, advice. Those people are not in the house here. I said they are not in the house here. The people I see here tonight are wiser than that. The Lord will make you wise. And you're not falling into the trap of these people. Advice, advice, advice in Jesus' name. Yeah. Am I talking to you there? Yeah. Look at this. Look at verse 9. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to these people? Now, sometimes you need to understand the language of people. It shows when they are not strong. When they are not strong leaders. It's, he is the king. And these people are men on the streets. And these people, the people that knew nothing. And he says, give me what we will tell them. He brought them in as if they were ruling with him. And so he said, which have spoken to me, saying, is whatever or somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us. Look at this. And the young man. That were brought up with him, speak unto him. These are his friends, saying, Thou shalt thou answer the people that speak unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. What an advice! Good advice? What kind of advice is this? 
bad advice. And for whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with waves, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam uh, on the third day as the king bade, saying, Come again to me uh, on the third day. And the king answered them roughly. And the king Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and answered them after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with waves, but I will chastise you with scorpions. And then it goes on verse 16, when all Israel saw that the king uh, would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king, saying, what have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tent, so Israel. And now David, see to thine own house. So all Israel went to their tents. The kingdom broke on its head. Your family will not break. Amen. The church, your pastor will not break. Amen. You know, when we're unwise and we talk as if we're a cruel man in authority, a tyrant in authority, and then we surround ourselves with people that don't have any milk of kindness in their hearts. And the thing they tell us and the way they advise us is like, uh, we're going to do this and we're going to talk talk and be rough with them. Let them know that you're not an you know, easy person to deal with. Because if you don't talk tough like that, if you look like honey, they will suck you up. So be like vinegar unto them and let them know that you are tough. That thing will break on your head. I pray your church will not break. The people God has given you to lead, I pray they will not scatter in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's come to the New Testament now. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. You think that the men who are reading about to be wiser than uh, they were. Matthew chapter 27, I'm reading from verse 17. Matthew 27, verse 17. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Look at verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered, tell me, many things this day in a dream because of him. And the wife came and he said, you're judging the judge of the whole earth. You're judging the king of kings and the lord of lords. Be careful, my husband. I need you. I need you to be alive. Because even though myself, I'm not involved with the judgment, I'm not involved with the case, in the dream, I suffered not just one thing. I suffered, I woke up, I suffered, I woke up, I suffered, I woke up, I suffered many things in the dream because of him. And then, uh, verse 20, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas uh, not, uh, and destroy Jesus. Let's come to Luke chapter 23 and see the problem of the man, the problem uh, of Pilate. Why he couldn't take to watch the wife I just said now, be careful, be careful of that hey, man, because I suffered many things in the dream uh, because of him tonight. We're looking at uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12, and Herod with his men of war said to him uh, at naught, talking about Jesus, and mocked him and arrayed him uh, in gorgeous robe and sent him uh, again to, what's the name? Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made, tell me, 
friends together because they were at enmity between themselves. And because uh, Pilate now was uh, going to win uh, Herod back as a friend. That's why he couldn't listen to what the wife had said. Don't touch that man. Don't judge that man. Don't get involved in the judgment of that man. He's French because they had been at enmity. And because of this case of Jesus now, they reconcile and they become friends. We're coming to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 12. John chapter 19 verse 12. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not, what? Caesar's friend. Friend. Now, you want to understand that if you allow this man, Jesus, to go, you're acting as if you're not going to judge him. You're acting as if you're not going to crucify him. You're acting as if you're going to release him. Remember, Caesar is your friend. And if you release this man, then your friendship with Caesar is cut off. You see, there are people, they know that this is the way to go. And this is the thing to do. But they want to keep Caesar as their friend. They want to keep the governor as their friend. They want to keep a politician as their friend. They want to keep so-and-so as their friend. They say, really? Were it not for my soft spot for so-and-so, I know this thing is wrong. I know this is not the way. I know I shouldn't go this direction, but what can I do? If I want to retain the friendship of Caesar and the friendship of Herod, I'm going to walk against my will and against my destiny. I pray that God will not allow you to be so intimate and associated in friendship with anybody when you know that this sin is going to ruin your soul that God is going to require from your hand on that final day why did you do that you knew more than that you've read more Bible than that and you know more doctrine than that and you know the will of God more than that why did you do that my friend, I couldn't resist the pull and the push. I couldn't resist the pressure of my friends. I pray that those friends that uh, try to trifle and gamble with your future, they'll not have power upon you in Jesus' name. You know, we started by saying God will help us to be doers of the world. God will help you. And God will help me. You know, you need to be thinking, who are my friends? Who gives me advice? Who tries to turn my neck and turn my mind? Who changes my consecration? Who puts pressure on me to such a point, I know that this is the direction to go, and yet I go this way? Who influences my family? That although I know this is the right thing I should do with my wife, but my friend, whenever my friend comes, I'm, you know, it's like I'm afraid of him. It's no more like a friend. It's like a tyrant. He's the Lord. He's the one that controls my action, controls everything about me. And if I'm, you know, if I hear the word of God and I say, Lord, help me, I'm going to go this way. Once my friend comes and he says, hey, I see that you are serious now, sanctified, sanctimonious. And the thing we have been saying before, you are becoming so serious as if, okay, I'm not a Christian, I'm not spiritual. That's what you are saying. Oh, no, how can I, my friend, why are you talking like, how can I, I, I that's, the, that's the impression you are giving me now. Because I talk to you now, you don't listen to me anymore. There's somebody, your wife is now the most important person, and then your husband, the most important person. I talk to you now, I say this and this, and you don't listen anymore. And then you, your heart is beating. You cannot say no to that man. You cannot say no to that woman. Those are the people, they toy with your destiny. Tonight, the Lord has delivered you. 
point number two now the corrective admonition of true friends the corrective admonition of true friends when we belong to the lord and when, when these things uh, things like this happen then we want to you want a friend that will come to you friends that can look at you face to face eyeball to eyeball and give you admonition corrective admonition that will correct what you are thinking of that will say no my brother you cannot go that, you won't go that way you won't do that thing this is wrong look at the bible look at this verse look at this verse look at this chapter hear this message and come and tell me what you see in the message no you cannot do that people who can be bold enough to talk to you those are friends those are friends because they have corrective admonition for you let's look at proverbs chapter 27 proverbs chapter 27 and i'm reading from verse uh, 5. proverbs chapter 27 tell me the verse here verse 5 and verse 6 look at this in verse 5 it says open rebuke is better than secret love open rebuke i'm not you are thinking of that i'm not that makes you sick i'm not you look at Tema, your half sister and then you say that uh, you can't touch her that's why you are getting sick rebuke him it says open rebuke is better than secret love faithful are the wounds of a friend faithful when you when your friend gives you the verse and you say ah it hurts me yes it ought to hurt you that's what i wanted to do i wanted you to see that what you are thinking of is foolish what you are thinking of is unimaginable what you are thinking of is devilish what you are thinking of is hellish use strong words because you see this is corrective admonition of a true friend that's why it says faithful at the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful look at verse 10 in verse 10 of that same chapter it tells us the known friend and thy father's friend forsake not neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother that is far off a brother that is far off he doesn't know your disposition he doesn't know uh, your likes and dislikes he doesn't know your weaknesses he always sees you strong and mighty it seems like you're almost like a giant every time he doesn't know the things that can make you fall and then you go to those people are you going to them they don't know you are you going to them they don't know your weakness are you going to them they don't know how kind of prayerless you are how carnal you are go to the people that know you and the people that love you and they will tell you to your face i don't agree you're thinking of that i don't accept you want to do that i don't approve of that and there is open rebuke it wounds you it makes you feel sorry and sorrowful but look at verse 17 iron sharpness iron so a man sharpness the countenance of who of his friend i pray god will help you in jesus name now now let's come back to jonadab when Jonadab saw Amnon in that condition, what will she have done? What will she have done? Number one, rebuke your friend. Rebuke your friend. Number two, reason with your friend. Reason with him. Amnon, see now here. Let us reason together. This thing you are thinking about, this thing that is making you sick, the sin that is so much in your heart, you can't eat anymore. This sin that becomes such a strong desire that you are not yourself anymore. Let's reason together. Number three, remind your friend. Remind your friend. You are not like this before. I knew you when you were saved. I knew you when you were born again. I knew you when you were on fire for the Lord. I knew you when you were reading the Bible. I knew you the first time I heard you preaching the boss. I said, oh my, something has come over my friend. Remind them. Remind your friend. Number four, restrain your friend. Restrain your friend. You are not going to contact that lady. 
You are not going to write to that lady. You are not going to phone that lady. You are not going to do anything. There's a restriction. You restrain your friend. Number five, restore your friend. Help him. We'll pray together. Help him. We might have to fast together. Help him. Uh, might have to just stay together. Just stay together. And don't allow him to have free time whereby he will do something uh, that will destroy him. Uh, number six, remain with him. Remain with your friend until, until that thing gets up. You see, when people are thinking of things like that, it's because they're all alone. And when they're all alone, there's infatuation, there's imagination. And there is uh, this thing that is, you know, bringing uh, their heart. But when you come to them and you, are, you jolt them, and when you jerk them, it's like you disturb their way of thinking. And then you begin to bring in other ideas. And you say, are we thinking about this? Are we thinking about this? Are we thinking about this? You are replacing the thought they had in their mind with positive things and with good things. And uh, before long, as you remain with them to make sure that this thing does not happen, things will change. And then, uh, if all those things do not uh, work, Report your friend. Report your friend. We're looking at this. Number one. What's number one there? Rebuke your friend. That's what we read in Proverbs. We're going to read that again. Rebuke your friend. Because it says in Proverbs 27 verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Open rebuke. Rebuke him. And then it says faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Jonada, that's what you should have done. Rebuke Amnon. You're thinking of that? Do you know what the word of God says? Rebuke him. Do you know that thing is an abomination? Do you know? Under the law, and it was still under the law, you'll be killed. You will die. If you do that, if you torture, you will die. Because that's what the law says. Rebuke him. Reason with him. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. And I'm reading from the first part of verse 25. Acts, chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 25. And as a reason of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Jonada, be a man of the world. You're going to be an advisor, be a man of the world. You're going to be an advisor, a counselor, be a woman of the world. That as you open the scriptures and you reason, you reason with Amnon, and you reason with this person that is uh, succumbing to temptation, they will tremble. Number three is to remind your friend. Remind your friend. Am I hearing the same person? Am I hearing that same fervent convert? Am I hearing that prayerful believer? What am I hearing? Am I, am I seeing the person that said, I will get to heaven if it's only one person in a family that gets to heaven? I will get to heaven? That's what I heard about you. That's what I knew about you. I'm hearing about a person that denied himself of this and denied himself of that and nothing could shake your commitment in the past. Who am I hearing? What am I seeing? Remind them. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 31. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance. It's reminding them now. Call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. My friend, all those things you endured, where will it end now? All the things you have gone through, all your consecration, all your service, if you go ahead in this direction and you allow this foolish thing to take hold of your heart, where will you spend eternity? And already Jesus told you, he goes to prepare a place for you in his heavenly father's mansion. And then he's coming back to take you home. All the persecution you had before, all the harassment of the enemy you had before, is this the way it's going to end? Remind your friend. Number four, restrain your friend. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Restrain them, restrain them. In 1 
1 Samuel chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 32. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 32. And David said unto Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which, has, uh, which sent thee this day to meet me. Blessed be thy, what's the word? Tell me out loud. Uh, some people have not opened their Bible. I said, blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which kept me back from hurting thee, except thou art hasted and come to meet me. Surely they had not been left unto labor by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. It was Abigail that restrained him. You see, we need people who can restrain us. We need people who are not just yes men, yes friend, yes, uh, yes women. Everything will say yes. And to go to the village, yes. I want to, uh, I don't think I want to attend the coming retreat, yes. I don't think I want to attend, you know, the leaders meeting now. It's like, you know, my bodies are too many and my challenges are too many, yes. Yes men, yes women. You don't challenge them. You don't restrain them. Uh-uh. You are going. We're going to that retreat together. Where are you? I said we're going to that retreat together. The Lord will bless you. And then the people that are coming with you, you'll be surprised. The Lord will embarrass you with miracles. And so you restrain them. Number five, you restore your friend. Restore your friend by prayer, by counseling, by, you know, helping, whatever. By challenging them, you restore your friend. Even if he has backsliding, we're looking at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do hear from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save the soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, you remain with them. Stay with them there. Stay with them. You might even have to stay with them in the house. You know somebody is uh, the old girlfriend. That's what they call them, sin partners. It's already, you know, it's, said, it's writing to them. It's just all of a sudden. This man who has been fervent, and this man who has been up and doing, but he's been praying to get, uh, you know, a wife, a life partner. I pray, I pray, I pray, and nothing is happening. All of a sudden, a text came up from the old sin partner, and the old sin partner is saying, I just remembered you today, and you know what? I'm still like you let me. And I don't know what's happening to you. And I just wanted to check up on you. All of a sudden, this man is saying, ah, look at this. And here I am in the church. I said that person, that person, and they all say no. And this fellow is still is writing to me. And then you wanted to come to the meeting and you just branch in his house. And then you say, are you ready? In the way you are, you are not dressed up. Are you not going to the meeting? I don't know whether I want to go today. Actually, um, I didn't want to tell anybody this, but you know what? I just got a text. What text is that? Show it to me. And then you read the text. You say, who is this? To tell you the truth, that's the person where we were to be. when I became born again, I said, never, never again. And I said, go your way. I'm going my way. I'm going to heaven. Somebody there is going to heaven. Yeah. What do you say? You'll get there in Jesus' name. I said, I'm going to heaven, leave me alone and all that. And she pleaded. I said, no, I've made up my mind. No matter what happens, heaven, I am going. And now, all of a sudden, I just got a text from her, you know, this morning. And said, if you are in town, I don't mind. I come and visit you. And uh, my mind is leaning towards that way, you know. And this and that, you say, ah. If you are like um, Jonadab, you say, okay, who knows? Maybe if you do that, then they will discipline you, of course, but you know, will support you. We'll be praying along. And then after six months and after nine months, they lift the discipline. You are married, you are married. That's Jonadab. Jonadab will not come my way. Uh, 
I cannot hear my people. They will not come your way in Jesus' name. And then, but what do you do? You will remain with them there. Let that person come. You see, my friend, it's either we go to the meeting together or I remain here with you. And then when that person knocks the door, your friend, if you're a true friend, there's a true friend here in the house today. Where is the true friend? If you're a true friend, you say, sit down. I'm going to answer him. Then you open the door. You say, can I help you? What are you looking for? Who are you looking for? I'm asking for, ah, no, I'm his friend. He's a born again believer. He's on his way to heaven. Didn't he tell you many years ago that there's no way, no road in that place anymore? There's no road there. If you come to this man, you will be like uh, somebody that allowed Jonah in the sheep. There will be no peace in that sheep. And we are deep alive. I'm supporting this man. I will, will report you to our pastor. If you, get, if you get hooked to this man, you are done forever. So if you don't want trouble, go back. And then she will go back. I said she will go back. Ah, you see, many of us who are not that bold today, but today the courage of a real friend will come to your heart in Jesus' name. Remain with them right there. And you will help them. They will not fall into sin. We're looking at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse, uh, from verse 15. Look at verse 15. It says in verse 15, Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv, that dwelt by the river of Keba, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. And it came to pass at the end of the seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, admit thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the watch at my mouth and give them a warning from me. Number seven, report your friend. If you've done all this, and then your friend is not restored. You've done everything you could do. And your friend is still saying, well, thank you very much. I appreciate, uh, you know, your concern and care for me. I appreciate the fact that um, you want to stop me from getting to Amnon. And they want to pursue the project of death. So you will now report them. Uh, you report your friend. We're looking at Genesis chapter 37. You cannot handle the case anymore. It's getting out of hand. And you cannot handle it by yourself. So you report your friend. Genesis chapter 37. And here we're reading from verse 2. It says, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph, tell me, brought unto his father, what? The evil report, the evil report. Uh, that's what uh, Jonadab should have done. He should have reported the thing to the father, to David, when he couldn't handle the case. We're looking at Jonadab now, and we're looking at you as a friend. We're looking at you as a true friend. And you have been, we've been dealing with the man that has the trouble himself. Uh, let, let's uh, shift our focus a little to the father now. Number one, inform the father. Inform the father. Now, if he had informed the father, the father would not have allowed Tamar to have gone there to see Amnon. If he had said, here is it, what this man has told me, and this is what is making him sick, inform the father. Number two, ignore your fears. Ignore your fears. If his life is precious to you, you're not going to be afraid that, okay, Amnon will get angry. Amnon will get unhappy with me that I let the cat out of the bag. Amnon will get angry with me that I told the father, tell him, because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't help it, I couldn't help you. That's the reason I have to inform your father. Ignore your fears. Number three, intimate your friend. Intimate your friend. You know what? It's not a secret anymore. Amnon... 
I told your father already. And I told him that this is what we are planning and this is what we want to do. You see, as a member of the church, you will let your pastor know. Let your pastor know that this is what this man is planning. This is what this lady is planning. And then ignore your fears that will say, who told the pastor? Who informed the pastor? Who was, uh, you know, the uh, tail bearer that went to tell the pastor? Ignore those fears. Number three, intimate your friend. Don't write anonymous letters. Don't say, uh, you know, somebody must have told the pastor. Intimate your friend and tell your friend, I told the pastor. Any bold person here tonight? Any courageous person here tonight? Uh-huh, I can't see their hands anymore. You'll be bold in Jesus' name. Now, let, let, let's, let's help Tema. Let's help Tema. Tema, what do you do? Number one, warn the ignorant. Warn the ignorant. She's ignorant. She doesn't know what Amnon is planning. And she, as in her ignorance, if uh, they, you don't make this uh, thing and then go and cook for your brother Amnon, uh, because she was ignorant, she'll just go, but warn the ignorant. Number two, wake up the individual. Wake up the individual. Say, hey, Tema, wake up. There is, uh, you know, danger. You know, you just dress carelessly. You expose yourself and say, I'm not this, my brother. It doesn't matter. I can go there night, 13 in the night. I can go there 11 o'clock in the night. It doesn't matter. Wake up the individual. Then watch over the innocent. Watch over the innocent. Watch over them. That's what the Lord has called us to do. And as we watch over them, they will not fall into the trap in Jesus' name. Number, point number three now. What's point number three? I said was point number three. Good class, good class. God will beautify your life. And this knowledge you have will make you victorious in Jesus' name. Number three, the corresponding acknowledgement of the truest friend. The corresponding acknowledgement of the truest friend. Jesus is the truest friend. And because he's the truest friend, he has given us warning. And then we follow the word that he has given us. We're looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 4. Luke chapter 12 verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, Jesus calls me friend. Jesus calls you friend. Thank God you are a child of God and a friend of Jesus. Be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him. Which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. In John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we're reading from verse 13, and see what he has done, and you look at the price he paid for you, and you look at the blood he shed for you, and because he's done so much for you, uh, you don't want to uh, go astray and then waste your life and destroy your destiny, he tells us in chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Look at the price he paid. And look at the blood he shed. And look at the thing he has done for you because of him. Are you going to say because of a cheap a kind of a lust of the flesh? You are going to then abandon what Christ has done. And then he says in verse 14, yeah, my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what he is a Lord doeth, but I call you friends. I call you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. And I pray we'll remain friends in Jesus' name. And if you are going to be a beloved friend of the Lord, look at Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 11. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 11. He that loveth pureness of heart. He that loveth purity of heart. He that loveth holiness of heart. He that loveth pureness of heart. For the grace of his leaves, the king shall be his friend. The king will be your friend. 
Jesus Christ is our best friend. He's our greatest friend. He's our truest friend. He's Savior. He's Lord. He has given us the best companion. He has given us the Bible. What a treasure he has given us. And then you have Moses there. And then you have Elijah, Elisha there. You have David, you have Paul, you have Peter, you have John. And you have all these writings. There are promises here. And there are commandments here. There are prophecies here. Everything that will gladden your heart. Whenever your heart is going in this direction. And your heart shouldn't go there. Pick up your Bible. That's your best companion. And look at the words of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away and read that word meditate on that word all those things all the foolish things in the heart everything will vanish away uh, you know sometimes i'm not uh, how do you get rid of these uh, things in your mind because i'm not is now trapped it says you know, Pastor, my heart is so filled with this. And I want to think of this. I want to think of this. And I'm trying to say, thought, get out of my thought. Get out of my heart. Uh, and it will not go out. I'm not, you know, it doesn't work that way. I'm not, can I talk to you? I'm not, what you do is this. Look at the drum of water. It's filled with dirty water. It's filled with something you don't want. And you want to get rid of that water. And you push the drum. It's too heavy. And you try to empty the drum. It's, uh, you know, it's filled up. You know, I'm not what you have to do. Bring sand and put inside. Bring sand and put it. Very easy. As you are putting the sand inside, the sand will displace the water. You understand? And then, as you feel that drum with the sand, all the water will be out. When you have bad thoughts, and you have evil thoughts, and you have all this infatuation, and it is coming to your mind, and you fight it, and the thing will not go, take this word of God. This one is heavier than that thought. Because it's the thought of God. It's the thought of Jesus. My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And read it, and put it inside, and put it inside. Before long, all those other thoughts, everything will vanish away. Then you become victorious. Not only that you're a real Christian, now you're a counselor. Now you're a leader. And you're going to help other people. And somebody here will help one Amnon somewhere, help one Tamar somewhere, help David somewhere. And you put things in order in their families in Jesus' name. From today, the Lord has made you restore us. He has made you repair us. And through you, many families, they're going to come to the right way. And they will live their life in Jesus' name. You will not die in sin. Your converts will not die in sin. And anybody that is facing trauma, trouble, as you get to them, you'll turn their lives in the right direction. The Lord has promoted you up here. Don't go down there. Are you promoted? Yes. Are you lifted up? Yes. Are you going to follow the word you have heard? Yes. Why don't you rise up and be a blessing? Be a blessing to the body of Christ.